coming up today, changing seasons and changing moods. What happens when the winter blues turn into something more serious? Good morning, I'm Jessica Lovell and welcome to the Morning Medical Update. It's pretty common to feel a little down during the winter time, but when that feeling simply won't go away, it is important to seek help. Today, we're exploring seasonal depression, sometimes called seasonal affective disorder. We'll ask why it happens and how something as simple as a big bright light can actually help. We also want to let you know that today's discussion will include the topic of suicide, including new data showing a concerning trend. Joining us here in studio with us is Dr. Greg Nowalnik. Across from me today, he's a psychologist and clinical director of psychology services at the University of Kansas Health System. Dr. Tyler Chervistad is a psychiatrist and the director of the Comprehensive Depression Assessment and Treatment Clinic also here at the health system. Good morning, docs, to you both. Good to have you both. Um, even better, though, to have uh, Becky Bolin. She has been living with depression for years. She is a patient of Dr. K's and recently started using a light to help in your treatment. So we're going to learn a little bit more about that in just a moment. So thank okay. you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. So, uh, all right, so Dr. K, I'm going to start with you. Verbally, um, we, we abbreviate seasonal affective disorder. It's SAD or SAD. Um, how do we how do we describe that or how, what do we say? Do we say do you have SAD or <laughs> do you have SAD? Yeah, so actually um, seasonal affective disorder is kind of an old colloquial phrase that we use. So when we're talking about uh, depression that's seasonal, we actually talk about it in the context of the underlying disorder. So major depressive disorder is kind of the common depressive disorder that people suffer from and so we call them with a modifier seasonal pattern and so that means they have a seasonal pattern to their depression. Um, seasonal affective disorder Disorder, um, is this kind of older term that we used to use. Um, there is a different component called seasonality, which is just the normal fluctuation of mood, and then you kind of get into the seasonal pattern of depression when you have functional impairment or some of the other symptoms associated with depression. And it's something we used to kind of call like kind of the winter blues. Mm -hmm. You kind of get into this funk, yeah. but it seems like we've now officially been, you know, calling it something so that people don't say it's more than just the blues for some people, right? Correct. Yeah, this is a pretty consistent thing that happens. Um, usually, if people have it, they're going to have it again 50 to 70 percent of the time um, in recurrent winters and so this is a natural progression of the depression it kind of cycles through on a yearly pattern given the winter months all right so I want to ask both of our doctors a lot of people we don't like the cold you know there's no sunlight you're less activity holidays family stress you name it there's a lot going on as we know but how do you distinguish between just you know being a little overwhelmed and kind of being a little bit down to like a legitimate mood disorder like seasonal affective disorder. Dr. Nawalik, I'll start with you. I think it's going to be about the intensity of the symptoms. So, I mean, you know, when we think about the holiday blues or mm -hmm. stress or winter, you know, when that comes on, um, you can see a certain decline in activity, going to bed a little earlier, mm -hmm. just kind of moaning the fact that like when you get out of work, it's dark, you know, you went in and it was you kind of dark. You get your pajamas, yeah. that's what I yeah. do. And so yeah. it's, th there's a certain natural reaction to that that, that isn't necessarily rising to the level where you'd be looking at a diagnostic consideration. So what we're looking at are things like you're not enjoying things that you typically enjoy. You start to avoid social interactions and pull back. Um, it, it's almost like a social hibernation, if you will, where like you just kind of unplug from your life. And then the more that we isolate, depressive symptoms like sadness, kind of looking at your life and questioning, what am I doing? What's this all about? What's the point of this? Those thoughts start to set in and eventually, if not checked or not addressed, it can lead to the thought of, you know, suicidal consideration and, and, and you know, that that's obviously an alarming situation that most people that go into winter don't go to that level. So that's the kind of differentiation right. that we're looking well, at. Well, and you can, it's hard though to tell because if it's something that you've dealt with or lived with for a while, it just starts to, it's kind of like a slow progression, I would imagine. Yeah, and, hard to distinguish. And the other piece is that, you know, sometimes in the winter there is a sunny day and people <laughs> ordinarily feel better, get a little lift. The, when we're looking at a diagnostic consideration, it's more days than not, you know, for an extended period of time. So it's not something that you're just going to say, like yesterday, where it was super foggy and gross and nasty. I think a lot of people felt a general malaise and kind of crummy sensation. Um, this is more, it, it goes throughout. Right. And you recognize you don't like the feeling versus right. kind of 
succumbing to the feeling of, yeah. you know, kind of fitting into this this drab time of, yeah. of the year. Dr. K, what can you add to that? Yeah, I mean, I just second what he said. Basically, you know, major depression is a two-week long period of having these symptoms, and so you're having that more days than not or nearly every day of depressed mood, lack of interest or motivation to do things, along with changes in your sleep, appetite, energy level, all of that, um, where if you're having just a seasonal pattern, maybe you're having a day or two here or there, kind of weather dependent. Um, maybe it's a few days, but it's not every day or most days over the course of two weeks. And so that's really the differentiator. Um, and so if you have a sustained period of two weeks, that can last much longer. I mean, people can be in depressive episodes for months at a time, where with a kind of a seasonality change in just your mood, that's going to be more day to day fluctuations. So how does it affect somebody who already maybe has some type of depression? Do they go hand in hand or can yeah. they be separate? Yeah. So um, Becky's probably a really good example mm -hmm. of this. She has um, regular depression, major depression, and then has the seasonal pattern on top of it. And so she's somebody that when the winter comes along, that depression gets worse. Mm -hmm. um, and so it exacerbates those underlying symptoms, that's something we commonly see. There are people out there, though, that have no depression during the spring and summer months and even early fall, and then when winter really hits, that's when the depression comes on. So there's a wide spectrum of symptoms, um, but you can have underlying depression and then get an exacerbation in the winter, or you can have no depression at all during the rest of the year and then just develop it only in the winter. Well, Becky, tell us a little bit about, about that for you, kind of that cycle throughout the year, and then when we get to this time of year, what's it like for you? Um, I definitely notice a difference, probably starting in about October, maybe the first of November, with my depression getting worse. I do have it all year long. But you and feel it coming on in a yes, different way. Yes. Or I kind of have like a baseline of like this is my normal depression and then just the progression of it for sure. And um, the past two Januaries, I've had a suicide attempt as well. So that just is really with in line with everything we've been talking about already and um, yeah. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And again, I just want to take a moment to say I appreciate you being here to share this. It's, Thank it's you. really important. And I know I speak for our doctors who are, we really appreciate you. Um, I want to talk about some therapy that you're on. And Dr. K, let's talk about light therapy. You're going to ex explain yeah. what it is. And we've kind of heard about it and these are all over the internet, but I want to know what it is how it works and how do we know where to find them and yeah. the right ones. So this is just a very small model of it. This is kind of one that we use for work, but mm -hmm. um, let me get this up to the max setting here. Oh, that's bright. Yeah, it's very bright. Um, so there's a luminosity component about this. So um, the light is all about the brightness, um, basically how long you're going to sit in front of it and then how close you need to be to it. Those are the three things that we tell patients about. Mm -hmm. So. Um, doesn't really matter the intensity of light, but it does determine your time. And so the higher the intensity of the light, the shorter your time. So the common um, standards that we use is 10,000 LUX. So that's a measure of luminosity um, and intensity um, for 30 minutes in the morning. And then you're going to want to be about 16 to 32 inches away from it in general. Um, you can be doing other things. We advise you not to stare directly at it. It will okay. blind you and you can cause... Uh, it's, I'm it's, looking at you uh, and so it's I'm like really... Like, like, so I'm yeah. just looking at it. Don't yeah. look at the box. Don't yeah. look at the you know, light. Like, you just <laughs> need to hit your face. It's got to be in the periphery of your vision. That's kind of the general rule. And so you want to do this for about 30 minutes. If it's not as effective as you'd like it to be, we can push it up to in 45 minutes, an hour. Some people even use it up to two hours a day just to feel better. Again, if you're going to use a lower intensity light, sometimes you need to use it for two or three hours because it's going to take longer to kind of give you that benefit. But yeah, lights are, are very helpful. They help uh, people with just regular depression without seasonal pattern. We'll actually see some benefit from it. Just, so. just kind of as an extra way to mm -hmm. give you that boost. Yep. Uh, Dr. Walnick, then so tell awesome. me how how much sunlight really plays a part. How much is it just biology when we talk about SAD? Um, how much is it the environmental things, and how much is it just within us? Well, I mean, when we look at the the seasonal component, there's a lot of. First of all, there there is no set lock. This is why and how it happens. There's certain theories around serotonin levels, uh, vitamin D levels, um, which can be impacted by the amount of sunlight. And then there's also uh, research still being done about the evolutionary component in terms of, you know, we have to recognize we didn't just pop up as people in the 1930s. We've been around for eons. And so um, we have to recognize that there are certain evolutionary uh, benefits to being, you know, a little more somnolent and just kind of staying in. Because back in the old days, you know, there wasn't electric light. And so walking around in the night was a dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you could fall, trip over something, hurt yourself. So we started to learn, let's just wind down the intensity, get in bed a little earlier. Um, and I think that it's important to note that, you know, the holiday celebrations largely grew out of that. It was sort of a battling against this idea of, 
this sort of malaise that can set in where we feel kind of down and, and crummy. So instead, we come out, you know, the Yule log is, was, you know, a Norse tr Nordic tradition where they'd chop down the biggest tree in the forest, bring it in, light that sucker ablaze and sit around and party around it for a while. And, you know, now we've seen the evolution of this and it's, you know, when we think about Christmas, nobody knows that Jesus was specifically born on December 25th. I hate to let everybody in on that secret, but we realized that we needed something to kind of give us a lift and send us into this period of dark, bleak existence. Uh, to give us a little, you know, warmth and a little soul. You know, well, so. and you're saying like feeling kind of down and crummy during a time when we're supposed to be celebrating and it's supposed right. to be fun and everybody's supposed to be with their family and it just simply isn't the case for everybody. Well, and and there, there's four letter words right there, supposed to be. Right. You know, we put so much pressure around, you know, what it's got to be. It's got to be the perfect this, perfect that. And there's no such thing as perfect, but a lot of people will use the holiday season to kind of as the blunt object they beat themselves with because mm -hmm. it's like, I've got to make the perfect, you know, menu for everybody and I've got to, we've got to invite everyone even though we can't stand them and don't get along we have to do it because it's what's right to do you it's know the right thing. and and it's just it becomes so stressful that that's something important to look at is that a lot of people get very overwhelmed emotionally around the holiday celebrations and that's not necessarily seasonal affective disorder or depression that has you know the seasonal pattern these are different animals and so we we have to diagnostically kind of tease these things out and look at circumstances of each individual um, so that's I love it when you come on because you keep it real. That's why you're always here. <laughs> you always just tell us how it's going to be. Mean, and thanks for the Christmas lesson. <laughs> and, um, and enjoy the holidays. And right? enjoy the holidays, <laughs> folks, for sure. Mm. Well, and again, you're we, we kind of talked about this conversation because of, of these lights mm. and, and just the way kind of we've evolved over time. Um, who is who is good? would be a good candidate for a, a lamp like this, this phototherapy. Yeah, I mean, that's, if you have major depressive disorder, you should probably talk with your psychiatrist mm -hmm. or physician about using them, because there are a few trade-offs that you want to know, and there are some side effects that you want to be aware of. Okay. But in general, if you notice like a seasonal dip in your mood, and you're kind of just <coughs> having normal changes in the winter, mm -hmm. most people can benefit this uh, from this, especially if they're getting up really early in the morning when it's really dark and it's hard to get going. Right. Um, just a couple of minutes, 20 or 30 minutes first thing in the morning can really help kind of get you energized and going for the day. What kind of side effects? Um, so the biggest one we tell people about is impacting your sleep. So if you use too much light mm -hmm. too long, it that can actually sense. make it harder for you to fall asleep. Some people notice a little bit of irritability or agitation. Again, all this is dose dependent. So if you use it for too long, you're going to experience these. And so usually what we have um, patients do is just dial back the time they use it if they're experiencing them. And so you can still get benefit. It just may be 15 or 20 minutes instead of 30 minutes or 60 minutes. And I understand there's a bunch all over the internet. So mm -hmm. how do you know what's, what's a good quality one? Yeah, uh, I would probably read the reviews on that. But if you're using a light and it's got, you know, kind of the certified um, 10,000 lux with mm -hmm. it. Really, that's kind of the only requirement there. Okay. Obviously, white light and blue light are more stimulating than like red light, and so you want to be very um, cognizant of that if you're trying to get that activation effect. There is a subtype of light therapy called dawn therapy, mm -hmm. which is using kind of a red light first thing in the morning, much lower intensity, so like 250. What, to like lux. mimic the, yeah, the sunlight? Yeah, sunrise, exactly. Up. And so they have um, alarm clocks that actually turn on for you in the morning and gradually turn up to this intensity. It's almost as effective as just bright light therapy for 30 minutes a day. Um, the only problem is if you sleep with somebody else in the room, they may not appreciate it as much so because right, they're right. gonna get woken up too so sure, sure. yeah but it, it's another type of light therapy that you can do it just uses red light as opposed to white light or blue light so. and you thought this would be helpful for Becky yeah I okay. did all right so let's bring you in <laughs> tell us how it's been going for you um, I've been doing it for about six to eight weeks now <clears throat> and um, were you skeptical at first or were you thinking I how was, is this really gonna help because <laughs> he told me about it initially last year I bought the light and then my all-or-nothing mentality um, told me it probably won't make that much of a difference, so just don't use it. Um, so that didn't work out very well for me. <laughs> and um, so I started using it daily, um, about 30 to 60 minutes a day. And um, sometimes I'll have to do it just like when I'm getting ready for work, um, just to get that time in, because I'm not in an environment that I can have it at my desk. Um, and. So I was gonna ask you, what do you do while the light's on? So you're getting ready, you yeah. just have it around you, <clears throat> and just around your environment, you keep it I on your desk at work? I do it like work. two feet away maybe, mm -hmm. um, while I'm getting ready, or the other thing I'll do while I'm doing it is I try and set it up as like a positive time for self-care. Good. So I'll try and listen to like positive music or um, like read quotes that are positive, things like that. The doctors are giving thumbs up and nodding their heads, saying they like everything <laughs> okay. they're hearing. Becky's yes. doing it right, right? Yep. Love it. Okay. Um, but and so you have noticed some changes. Like you use this a few. 
couple months mm -hmm. and you're noticing, uh, you know, when did you start to notice it and maybe did you, you know, kind of tell us a little bit about how you've been feeling. Um, I've been, I've noticed it probably within the last like three weeks or so. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. K was actually the first one who said something in my last appointment about how he noticed a change. Um, but I noticed like, it's definitely in combination with everything else I do. I'm in counseling, I see Dr. K, I um, like do the positive things. Yeah. And um, so it's just kind of like a catalyst, I feel like. and Like a layered my, approach yeah. to all of the other things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. K, tell us a little bit about when you see her and when you're, uh, it, it must be encouraging to see yeah. positive signs when she comes to visit you. Yeah, absolutely, it's, it's great. And you know, we saw improvement in energy level, kind of overall mood in general. Those are the things we expect to see. Uh, hopefully <coughs> not sleeping as much because we're kind of using that to our advantage if we're activating you a little bit. We're trying not to get you to sleep as much, which is a common feature of winter depression. And so, yeah, it is a layered approach. So um, you can use light therapy on its own for very mild depression or maybe mild, moderate depression, but for more moderate to severe depression, it is a combination approach, right? We're doing psychotherapy, we're doing medications, we're doing bright light therapy in the winter, and so, yeah, it's a multimodal approach, and so that's what we would like to see is kind of what Becky's response has been. Good, good. And Becky, you had mentioned that your depression, you know, dates back to middle school, and that you have been on medication and, and doing therapy and things of that nature, but you said, you know, in the last couple of years that there really have been some rock bottoms. Mm -hmm. What can you share about that? Um, I had some trauma happen and um, like with the suicide attempts, um, some of the rock bottom was even after the attempt itself. I thought like the suicide attempt was the rock bottom, but it was really after that because you have to still deal with everything that was going on before the attempt as well as the consequences of the attempt itself. So. Um, I would say like one thing I've definitely noticed um, within the past three weeks or so is initially I wasn't, I'm not necessarily glad that the suicide attempts didn't work, yet I've been able to shift to a more positive mind frame of like just becoming more glad that I am here at the same time. We are so glad you're here. Dr. Nwalik, when you hear Becky share that story, what do you think? Um, and what can you kind of help us understand about that? Because she mentioned something, yeah. a failed suicide attempt, yeah. but then now you have the repercussions of that on top of the trauma that was already there. Well, I mean, there's so many things that she said there really resonated. Um, I'm gonna go further back initially about the all or nothing thinking, which when we see uh, a pattern of major depression, um, you see this change in cognition where you're not able to effectively really interpret environmental cues around you. Uh, you'll, you know, the depression becomes like a blue lens through mm -hmm. which you interpret every single aspect of your life. And so, um, you know, the world doesn't exist in black and whites, all or nothings, but depression will convince you that it does. And, um, you know, once it, you get enough of that and you pull back from support systems, it'll even start to twist messages from your support system. So you'll start, even if somebody says, I love you, I really care about you, okay, it'll in, twist that to, it'll be like, oh, they're just saying that for them. You know, it's not about me, they don't really care, they just don't want to have to worry about what's going to happen, or I'm, I'm more of a burden now. And so these kind of thoughts take over, and that's what leads to that suicidal potential where we start thinking, um, you know, it'd be better if I wasn't here. And so then, if you get to the point of an attempt, and thankfully a failed attempt, um, you know, afterwards there's that moment where you wake up and you're like, oh hell, you know, and mm -hmm. now you realize people are gonna know, mm -hmm. this was a very, for, for depressive individuals, it's a very dark secret that they carry, this is why when people ask about what should you do around someone that you suspect is maybe feeling depressed, talk, ask. You know, it, it, the more that, that you can engage, it starts to take away and disarm some of the power of that secret. Yeah. It allows them to feel that there's a better opening and a connection and that you know, you can start to work against that lens. Um, so yeah, there, there's a real significant potential afterwards for another downslide because it's, you know, you, you look at yourself and you think, I really tried to die and I couldn't do that 
like you know, you, you see you the, the yeah, you see <clears throat> the attempt for self-flagellation that comes after that, right. and then having to have difficult conversations and the, that internal sense of like everyone walking on eggshells around you now and being very disingenuous, maybe because it's awkward, you know, trying to figure out how do we engage someone after that. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, there is no right way or wrong way. It's just do it. We have to make sure that we're connecting with the people because we want to communicate caring in any way possible. Uh, that's the real antidote to uh, the depressive ideation is the more that we're around people, the more we're connected because that isolative stuff and that's where the seasonal stuff gets really kind of dangerous because as we point out, it's not a specific, you know, seasonal affective disorder just nails somebody. It's usually an exacerbation of either major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder that we see. And so it's basically like if you're carrying this heavy burden already that's like 200 pounds every day, mm -hmm. the seasonal shift is like somebody throws another 50 pounds on sure. it. And you're like, oh, you know, and it's just, it becomes too much. It, it breaks you down. It's like and drowning. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about suicide, there's new information that came out, new data from the CDC showing that suicide deaths in the U.S. reached a record high last year. So really, uh, Dr. K, tell us just how serious of a health issue is this right now? Yeah, I mean, suicide's an extremely serious issue. I mean, between the opioid uh, pandemic or uh, crisis and the pandemic that caused social isolation, I mean, we're just seeing increasing um, meaningless, basically, in the society. People are, are struggling to find uh, a meaning or a sustaining purpose to get them through difficult or cha challenging times, and so it's really increasing and putting a strain on our mental health um, services and lines. And so we're, we're booked out here at the clinic. I mean, it's a sad mm -hmm. state of affairs where we have huge amounts of people that aren't just able to get in immediately, and our, our hospitals are the same where we're seeing lots of patients come in it's for suicide. It's telling a story. Yeah. Dr. Nolnick, you know, it's been a year. Remember a year, you came and sat next to me and I told you, this, t this time, about two weeks is the, the anniversary when my friend took her life. Mm -hmm. Left two children behind. Yeah. Becky, you have two sons. Yes. You have, you have mm -hmm. two sons. Mm -hmm. I don't want that happening. We don't want that happening. And I want to show pictures of them because this is not your identity, <laughs> what we're talking about today. That's your identity right there on the screen, those boys. Tell us about them. Um, they're definitely why I'm here and what I why, why I do what I do mm -hmm. um, is the motivation um, to help them grow up hopefully without that depression piece mm -hmm. or mental illness and yet at the same time to teach them how to respond to others that do have illness like that. Yeah, you have so much to teach. Uh, Dr. Noel, like you were going to say something about this crisis and what you're seeing. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that in the immediate wake of the pandemic, we didn't see the super high spike in numbers that a lot of people were saying, oh my God, it's suicide, you know. So this is that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it was gonna take time. <clears throat> and I think that when we look at the trauma and the impact, and it was interesting because a, a popular show returned, you know, and I watched the first episode, and it was linking back to COVID. And mm -hmm. I kinda had this thought of like, you know, let's not beat this thing again. You know, this is over. Like, do we really have to go back to that? Mm -hmm. But I realized that, you know, it is important that we still talk about it because while we've largely moved on, mm -hmm. I don't know that a lot of people really processed what we actually encountered. You know, like the gaps of, of kids being out of school, which I was certainly a, a proponent of at the time, but now we're seeing some of the impacts of mm -hmm. that homeschool, that, that lack of that socialization at critical periods for some, some of the kids at certain ages. Um, and we're also seeing, you know, the shift in workplace environments where so much of the, so many things have transitioned to virtual or, or tele options that I think we're starting to see some of the burnout spikes around that. I think that whereas before you would never have seen the number of lunch meetings that we do now, there used to be a carve out, you know, in a work day for you get an hour to kind of you know, mess around, talk to colleagues about stuff that isn't work, eat something, a little bit of self-care in that, mm -hmm. maybe go for a walk. Downtime, yeah. Now we've got, you <laughs> gotta be on this meeting at lunch because you know, we're all eating lunch. It's okay, you can eat on camera. Nobody wants to be seen eating on camera, but you get encouraged and you even have to sometimes agree that I'm gonna be on a meeting, you know, and I'll be on camera during the meeting because if not, it's like you're, maybe you're not there, you're not respected. It's like, maybe we need to be more prioritized around our, you know, how we're, carving out our boundaries. time. Boundaries? Yeah, and boundaries. Yeah. Because I think that in a lot of ways those have fallen by the wayside and as boundaries decline and that work-life balance starts to erode, when you're doing, you know, if you're doing a, a job that even if it's something that makes a huge impact or big difference, mm -hmm. it's still stressful. 
And so not having those little bits of separation, that's gonna take a toll as well. And so the more that we feel burned out at work and then we come home and for parents, you've got kids, it's like the job that never ends. Mm -hmm. They're wonderful, beautiful gifts. I'm gonna give that, but they are work. It's a real it's a whole new job. job. You know, I've talked about that. We come yeah. home from work and it's like, I gotta get mentally geared up for my whole other job. Yeah. <laughs> my other full-time job and being a parent. And right? arguably the one that matters most. Exactly. And sure. so it's the one that when we're all ready, we've poured out our, our, our emotion that we have to give all day. When we come back, we only have like this much left. And when we get some bad news from our kid, we react probably in a way that makes us, you know, and especially if you're depressed, it makes you more self-loathing. It makes you feel so super mm -hmm. self-critical. And we really want to be making sure that we're encouraging people to take the time for themselves. I want to put a very important uh, crisis number up. Uh, last summer, there was the new nationwide crisis number 988. Again, anybody struggling with mental health crisis, knows somebody, you're feeling suicidal, contact 988. Uh, you can connect directly to a crisis counselor. Um, Dr. K, how important was that Do you, uh, in the moment and moving forward when we implement new mm -hmm. standards of how we look at mental health and how we reach out to people? How important is that going to impact? Is that going to make? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm probably in the minority. <coughs> uh, I, when I think about suicide and suicide treatment, mm -hmm. uh, it's a multimodal approach. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want people to think that the suicide hotline um, is um, uh, an a substitution for actually getting in with a physician, mm -hmm. getting on medication and management. It is a tool, it is a thing that we add on to our care, but it is like the last line of defense. It is really? literally that thing that when patients are home and they have no other options, they can't get a hold of their physicians. Um, the data on suicide hotlines is pretty equivocal, whether it actually helps stem the tide of suicides or whether it's really just more of an outlet. But you said things have been so busy. These yeah. clinics are packed. What is somebody supposed to do? That's correct, yeah. So our EDs are full and everything. So again, it's a tool. It's mm -hmm. one of those things that if, if you've got nothing else to turn to, it's going to be very helpful and we do put it in all of our, our wrap-ups for all of our patients mm -hmm. just so they know they have a listening ear but as far as like actively managing suicide this is not going to help us kind of treat that um, thing it's really just there to kind of temporize things until people can get in with the appropriate professionals to get the care they need uh, um, yeah. and so it, it is it is a tool and we just want to make sure that people know they're using it as a tool and not as a substitution for actual medical care. Quick response to that because uh, we brought you on last year when this hit yeah. uh, have we seen any any data on if it's been helpful? I haven't seen the data um, I do know that you know when you're in the moment of crisis if you can't access a professional, it's still better to reach out mm -hmm. and talk to someone mm -hmm. than to do nothing. Um, but I think that, you know, we're, we're going to see the data that's going to come out about this. It's going to be researched. Um, but I think the most important aspect, uh, you know, to along with Dr. Jorvistad said, is we want to be making proactive efforts. We want to be working ahead of the crisis. We don't want to be reactive in our care and mm -hmm. reactive in our accessing of mental health. All right, if you have any questions, be sure to jump on the chat on YouTube or Facebook, tweet us, or email the Medical News Network. Info is right there on your screen. Of course, normally this is the part of the program where Dr. Hawkinson delivers the COVID count. We have given him the day off. So I will share that this week the health system reported 17 active uh, COVID active inpatients. So we are all hoping those numbers either stay around that level hopefully will decrease in the next few weeks. But remember, it's also flu and RSV season. So wash your hands, get vaccinated and please stay home if you're sick. So let's get to some questions from our viewers this morning. Um, is the therapy that Dr. K showed covered by insurance? I think if you have a health savings plan, you can use it for a reimbursement on that device. <coughs> Most of these on like Amazon, you can buy for 15 or $20. They're not terribly expensive lamps for like these small ones that we showed today. But yes, I think they are reimbursable under like a health savings account. Whether your actual insurance plan would cover that, I think would be policy specific. Okay, question. What's the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist and the services that they offer? I'm gonna let you take it. You take oh, it. Me? <laughs> <laughs> medication, no medication. There it is. How do you know though, going in, what you need? I mean, um, is that something you would refer uh, if somebody needed would, a different level? It'd, it'd you guys work mutual, tandem. Yeah, it'd be, a, it'd be a mutual referral. We share a lot of patients. Um, you know, it's basically, you have to think of a, a psychiatrist time. It, it, it's relatively cost prohibitive for them to do in-depth, you know, individual therapy. And that's so, what you're doing. That's what I'm doing. You're digging yeah. deep into the issues. I'm doing testing, I'm doing mm -hmm. therapy, um, you know, so I'll help with diagnostic clarification and then obviously, you know, ongoing individual therapy and group therapy. But uh, I can never touch a medication and I'm happy to not, so I'm great to refer to, right. to Dr. George. Okay, no, that makes sense. I, I think, yeah. I would just say that combination approaches, so medication management and psychotherapy are proven to be better than either one of them by themselves. Uh, right, So you, right. Want, you want to be doing both. It's not one or the yeah, other. Correct. It's, right. it's a yeah. combination for Absolutely. sure. Um, question from Charlie. When someone has depression, what's actually happening in the brain? Is this a chemistry issue? <laughs> so. <clears throat> 
the common trope that this is a chemical imbalance is not terribly accurate. It's a, it's a colloquialism that we use to kind of explain to people. Depression is multimodal, right? So it's behavioral, there may be some chemical imbalances to it, but it's also neurostructural, right? So you have areas of your brain that actually s stop functioning or decrease functioning when you're depressed that would normally be there in a normal functioning brain. Um, and so basically depression is a long-term change in the structure of the brain and how you respond to it. So I describe it as ruts, right? If you drove down a dirt road every day, you would eventually create ruts in that road, mm -hmm. and it'd be much harder for you to drive on other parts of that road. So that's all depression is, is you're selecting for those kind of depressive pathways over time. What medications, what therapy, what other interventions uh, do is basically like smooth out those ruts so that you can maybe navigate a different path um, to get through that. Um, a question. Uh with based on what Becky has shared today, is this something, is this a lifelong journey? Like we talk about something with any other illness or uh, chronic problem that they have in their life, they have to just have lifelong medication and therapy and have to have check-ins. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, so it really depends on where you're at in your depressive stage. Mm -hmm. So the more depressive episodes you've had in your lifetime, the more likely you are to probably have a, a a need for ongoing therapy permanently. So basically our general rule is three. If you've had three major depressive <clears throat> episodes in your lifetime, we're probably not gonna take you off medications. We're probably gonna have you in some form of therapy uh, lifelong at that point. So if you've had less than that, we will always try to get you off medications. We'll always try to use really high quality therapy to give you the skills necessary to manage your depression without medication. That's our goal is not to have to medicate you forever, but mm -hmm. if you do have multiple episodes, your recurrent rate gets up to around 70, north of 70%. And so the odds that you're gonna have one of those flare ups again is quite high. And so it's unsafe from a suicide standpoint to recommend stopping at that point. Well, we do have to wrap up today, mm -hmm. but I will say this is the one topic of all the topics we talk about on this program. This is the one topic I think we should be talking about for <laughs> an hour and 30 minutes. So um, I just want to thank everybody for being here uh, to talk about something so important. Dr. Nawalnik, what's the biggest takeaway for somebody listening today? Um, you know, for real, I think it's just about giving yourself grace, uh, taking moments to take care of yourself, recognizing that you do have to put your oxygen mask on before helping someone else. I, I say that ad nauseum, but it, it's never more true than it is around going into difficult or stressful situations or you know periods like holidays. So make sure you remember why you're doing what you're doing, which is that we want to secure the relationships around us. We want to take care of ourselves. We want to be able to make the memories and, and have the good times and that sometimes you know we get so focused on wanting to make sure everything is right and the reality is that if you think about the best stories that you tell around your family table there are the times when things went absolutely haywire and wrong and so being able to make light of that and share it with your family and friends is really the best and that's what it's all about so take care of yourselves and if you notice that you're starting to get into you know one of those ruts like dr jarvis had talked about where you start to see things all on the darker side and aren't able to find a way to find the light reach out and that was a figurative pun there the light anyway mm -hmm. um want to make sure that you're reaching out and trying to you know get connected to a mental health professional um while in-person clinics may be bogged down there may be a wait there are a lot of telehealth options that are available and something is better than nothing even if it's just a little something to get you through get on that wait list for in-person sessions and then try some of the online options just to help nurse you through because i promise something is going to be better than nothing 100 percent of the that's time. the takeaway something yeah. better than nothing dr yeah. K, what is the takeaway in your opinion from today's chat yeah, you don't have to suffer alone. I think that's the biggest thing. Is everybody feels like it's too big. Their story is, is too um, consequential that they can't share it with anybody else. And so I hear hundreds of stories a week about pa patients that are suffering. Um, and so I think it's just important to know that no matter how bad things get or how terrible you feel or how terrible your circumstances are, there are still people out there that can help you and that we have the resources to do that. And so just reach out. Becky, preserving your life is saving other people's lives. So we just, again, so glad you are here. And I appreciate you sharing your story. I want you to have the, the end word today and just share anything you want. Take your time and share anything you want people to know. Okay, thank you. Um, for those struggling, just my advice is hold on and remember that it can get better no matter how much you think it can't and won't get better, it can. Um, reach out to your providers as we've already been talking about. Everybody's plan is individualized. For example, um, since I know that I struggle more in the winter months, I um, was proactive and decided to schedule monthly appointments mm -hmm. with Dr. K when normally I don't have that. And then um, sometimes it is just that one extra tool to add. Even back in August, um, I had like some of the highest depression and like suicidal ideation, even up to probably at least 100 times a day. 
um, and I didn't realize how bad it was until I didn't have that. So it was nice to see that and just know that even if you think it's minor, it can make the biggest difference of putting you back into better mental health. And then um, my biggest piece of advice is to just be honest with both yourself and your um, healthcare team and support system at home. Um, it's a hard thing to do out there, but it's really gonna make the difference. And um, like they both kind of said, um, there's nothing that they haven't heard and they can't help you unless you're honest. All I'm gonna say to you is thank you. Thank and again, you. glad you're here. Come thank back you. anytime, okay? <laughs> thank you again to all of our guests and to our viewers for being with us today. We're gonna to leave you with a follow-up to this past Monday's announcement that the University of Kansas Health System will be the official healthcare provider of the Kansas City current women's soccer team. So newborns here at the health system are already showing their support for the Kansas City Pro Team. So take a look, have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday. Coming up Monday on the Morning Medical Update. Had Thomas just said, I got the wind knocked out of me and went back into the game, it could have been a lot worse for him. A young football player didn't realize he was in a medical emergency, but the expert on the sideline did. I'm Alexis Del Cid on the next Morning Medical Update, athletic trainers and their critical role in high school sports. How they identified one young man's injury before anyone else even noticed. Monday at 8 a.m. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.